it is all day live. It is. It's. Uh, I hope we're all alive uh, after we get information about things that have tried to make us not alive. In a sense, that's usually what I look at in the independent media, alternative journalism. You might call it investigative journalism. Uh, if the certain people in Congress have their way, they're going to make it so that we can't even be journalists anymore or have a freedom to do that. I'm Wilpie Wilson. This is All Day Live. And we are from Seattle. And we broadcast uh, on YouTube. We go to our, you can find us streaming on seattlecommunitymedia.com during the week in the regular schedules. Uh, and we try to bring out information we think is necessary to find remedy for our community communities. Uh, that's why we've been doing these broadcasts. I work with Patricia Shoup and Don Gron creating the Call for Investigation show as well. And I provide the support for Don Gron with Truth Versus News and Always Pursuing Truth. Those are other programs broadcast weekly scheduled here at seattlecommunitymedia.com. In Seattle, that's public access or community access to, to most people. And we've covered a lot this last year. I've covered the cannabis industry, trying to help steer it, guide it interviewing such people as Javin Shively or Sharon Foster. She is the Liquor Board Chairman here, and that's been a, been a, uh, quite the, the amount of informational type thing going on here in the Northwest with you know, the specifics of I-502 and other initiatives now going on with 522 and trying to find labeling for uh, Monsanto food. Strange that our country is the only country right now that has not stopped GMO foods. Think about that. That's interesting. Why our country alone? So uh, is that the authorization and legality of them being able to do things like murder us through our own food agricultural system? Something like that. But I've mentioned on the grant, organic cannabis could be filed as addendums to the state and federal uh, 1991 organic certification bill through the Senate which is all they have to do, and it would no, no longer be scheduled anything. It could scheduled to be used for helping keep us healthy, keep us from having cancer, which it's found it does. It makes life better for people that do have it. In case they don't have a chance to live, they can at least go comfortably. But it also helps remove nuclear contamination from the human body, from the soil, from the water, something a bit you didn't know. And now, as we're about to hear from Stu Webb, and Lee, Lee Wanda, Ambassador Lee Wanda, that's for, uh, he was the ambassador to Somalia. He was under the Reagan administration back then. But I want to mention this to you people. Very soon, we're, our entire ocean system will not be able to provide seafood to us. We have an extinction event occurring at this very moment. And I know Stu will get into this maybe later, but we're going to cover the uh, history of what Lee Wanda has gone on. But the world thinks of him as called Leo Wanda. So we get the Lee and the Leo figured out here. And he's quite a very important figure in this time period where we've had crime syndicates. Some people think of them as circumstances of that's what our government is. Well, there's a lot of evil on this planet, people. But I was going to get back to this real quick. Cannabis uh, we may be the only food protein source, one of the few we may have soon. So think about that. Brown's gas may be the only type of plasmatized water that can neutralize nuclear waste and be consumable by humans and animals and plants. Think about that. There's a lot going on. It's a lot that we have to deal with to find remedy. Uh, and I'm greatly honored. I'm going to get to my guest here, Leo Wana, Lee Wana, Ambassador Wana, and Stu Webb. Stu, uh, I appreciate it. I'm greatly honored. Uh, I know that you work with uh, Gordon Duff, and that's VeteransToday.com. And uh, we've covered a lot of issues from ISON to other things, but we're going to cover the issues with uh, Ambassador Juana. Uh, and as I've mentioned in the back, I've got your, one of the stories from Rents.com behind me. Where do we start? How do we find remedy? I mean, it's a circumstance where the world is literally spinning out of control and spending out of control. So what do we do? I'll hand the ball off to you. I'll hand it off to Leo. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. But the biggest thing we got to do, we got to let our fellow Americans, as Reagan will always call them, know the truth. We're not bank bankrupt. We do have assets well over $27.5 trillion we made when we took down the USSR in the Cold, in the Cold War, as Reagan called it, the evil empire. And with all the foreign exchange and financial things we were doing, in my capacity as a secret agent directly only reporting to President Reagan under the tote, the tote, the Toten doctrine, T-O-T-T-E-N doctrine, that meant I was his special consultant, special advisor. I was not working for Uncle Sam. I was working for the president himself in the United States government as the president when he was elected. 
we met in California, uh, William Friend Smith, the future Attorney General, Colby and Casey of the CIA, and their plans was to how do we control our country, our country that they just were elected to serve. And they brought me in because I was background with uh, U.S. Senator Alexander Wiley back in 1954-55 when he was at a junior chief achieve, achieve, achievement meeting as the, as, as the guest. And he knew I was working prior to that as a young boy. I think I was like probably 13 years old. My job was to go to the John Burt Society on behalf of J. Edgar Hoover, and my parents were paid $42.50 a week to be like the janitorial services at the John Burt Society in Milwaukee on Valley Street. So I would go in there when they had meetings, and I would gather up all the, send out the bulletins and pass them out, you know, like an usher in a church. And at the end, I would pick up and clean up everything. And one of the books I remember was None Dare Call a Tree Trees and other handouts that they did. And then when I got left and everything, I cleaned everything up. And naturally, I took the garbage along, got on a streetcar at 58th and Valite, because I lived at that time at 37th and Valite, and the FBI agent would be already be on the uh, streetcar, and I would deliver the package, or shall we say the material, whatever J. Edgar Hoover expected to get, which I just picked up stuff. I didn't, certainly didn't have a chance to read it and scan it and, and question so I would get off at 37th and Valite. He would probably get off at 35th. I don't know. My, another car was always behind us, so I'm sure they went down to the FBI headquarters downtown Milwaukee. But uh, that's how I was introduced to the intelligence community, at least at the FBI, because that was CIA at that time only had their authority outside of the United States. They were never allowed to do anything in the domestic, domestic area, and I still that's in the in the charter. So. When the CIA is doing this or this or this in the United States, I question that because I don't think they have a charter to do to do that, and that's where we were. So, Senator Alexander Wiley of the United States Senate was the chairman of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He knew my background, being studied and trained, and and shall we say, was involved within the intelligence uh, uh, machines from Milwaukee. And uh, Frank Bellastray was involved because there was a murder, there was a lot of murders in Milwaukee at that time, the mob was controlling. And uh, at Isidore Polgrob, P-O-R-G-O-B, was uh, found shot down in the Mequon uh, uh, Gully. And he owned the Brass Rail in Milwaukee, a third in Wisconsin. And the mob was trying to move in and take over the entertain, entertain, entertainment community. And that's where I got involved because people within the brass rail that were employees there, I knew. So somehow I got involved in uh, watching what was going on because of certain other relationships I had. And one of the, let's see, the gal, the hat check girl called Susie. And of all people, she was, uh, her best friend was a Green Bay Packer football player, which I won't mention his name. So I had a chance to meet him, and that was neat, because at that time was all of uh, 16 and 17 years old. So that was an interesting thing. So I had my, shall we say, my credentials within the uh, in intel community. And eventually I got involved in the Milwaukee Police Department, the Monomity Falls Fire Department, Waukesha County Sheriff's Department, all planned as a cover story for training uh, EMT, a paramedic, and so on and so, so, so forth. So that established my background. So in December 1980, I also did a lot of work for uh, uh, with, with, Nixon, with Nixon. I reported at that time to, to Ray Fleming, F-R-E-M-I-N-G, which was a special assist, assistant as we used to call him, Tricky Dick Nixon, the President of the United States. So there's a many, many programs and projects and training I had and a career in, in, the, uh, in satellites and uh, the moon landing and stuff. Involved, involved, not on the trip, but learning the, the machining points. And I became, I went to college for Uncle Sam. I went to serve the five-year apprenticeship and tool and die for Uncle Sam. So I become really 
shall we say, a glorified machinist and a tool and die maker, and my degree is in dust, in dust, industrial engineering, and I'm 12 credits short from a mechanical because I never got back to finish the other 12, but I still have my engineering degree, and I only had to take a couple courses to get the other 12 credits I was short. So in reality, Uncle Sam paid all my training, but I was never employed by them. I was, shall we say, under the blanket of the intelligence community for obvious reasons. Member of the Milwaukee Police Department, Waukesha County Sheriff's Department, Village of Manani Falls Fire and Rescue Squad, and off to my education and, shall we say, getting prepared for special things that at that time I really wasn't full, fully aware of. It. I don't think they did either. So in 1980, off to California, met President-elect Reagan, William Fred Smith, the future Attorney General, Casey, Kobe, and others, as they were planning as of next month to take over as the President of the United States they were, they, were, they were questioning the mob, questioning the assassination of JFK, and Rob, uh, Robert Kennedy, and uh, taking down the USSR because Khrushchev had banged on the table what everybody remembers at the United Nations with his shoe, and he was going to bury us with our own shovels. So all of us had many, many programs and projects and programs <coughs> we'd like to be part of. And after that, the rest is his. Is, is history because I investigated the mob in Milwaukee back in uh, 81. They sent me an ad assignment because they knew that Frank Bellastray and others were involved in Operation Elm Street. And we wrote some stuff on, the, on our, web, our website that shows the targets of our investigations and who was doing the funding because you have to understand that, that did a lot of work and Operation Elm Street was top on our list for President Reagan that who took down JFK and Bob Kennedy and others along the way. And uh, it was quite important because Reagan did not trust the Federal Reserve. He wanted to eliminate them just like JFK did, wanted to come with their own currency, their own dollar. He knew the Federal Reserve was not a bank, was never a bank, it's not to be meant to be a bank, and it wasn't a legal entity nor an agency of the United States. And that's why Bill Casey was going to establish ISA to take the pick of the litter of the CIA and get rid of all the drug traffic and all those other hanky-panky things they were doing and reestablish, take the pick of the litter and start ISA, which would have been the replacement for the CIA. So they would stay international and not uh, political acts outside of their mandate. Uh, Leo, since you mentioned Bill Casey, I I don't want to take you off track, but Bill Casey... uh, he was basically going to testify before Congress on everything that was going on. And the day that he was to testify, he suddenly had that cerebral hemorrhage or whatever it was and yeah. laid in Bethesda Hospital for two weeks. Right. And, uh, uh, of course, some people were able to visit him, but they closed off the floor below him and above him, had security Certainly. around him. And the doctors and nurses all mysteriously were either suicided, died in car crashes, or, uh, or uh, died of heart attacks all within six months. Were you aware of that? Well, I knew about it, but I certainly wasn't going to poke my nose into that because I had other assignments which involved special things and special programs that President Reagan wanted. Right, but he was going to testify and let everybody know the truth about Iran-Contra affairs, that second He was going operation. to protect President Reagan 100% Iran-Contra. He knew everything about that. I was very much involved in Iran-Contra, and I was also working for Reagan at that time. And that's when we picked up the HN5A, uh, shall we say, the uh, the, cl- the clone value from China. It's because uh, there was some kind of agreements that nobody understood and nobody respected except the bad guys, that the Soviet Union had the Hein helicopters in, Nic- in, Nic- in Nic- Nicaragua, and we could not use the red eye, nor could we use the stingers, nor could we protect our people that we were, shall we say, uh, helping to protect themselves from the San 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 Denistas. So I was in Beijing. We went to a certain supplier of Chinese military. They're all Chinese military. They're certainly not uh, private contractors. And we procured the HN5A model, which was a a, uh, knockoff of the Red Eye, because we were told clearly we could not use the new stingers from from General Dynamics. So we bought a bunch of them 
from Peking at that time, and you don't need to know a manufacturer, it's in the book that uh, we had published. It took us five years to, uh, to get the book printed on uh, uh, Amazon and Kindle, which just came out about three weeks ago, all authorized. And the HN 5A didn't have the sights, didn't have the, you know, they had scopes, but it was just like trying to shoot a bow and arrow. But if we had enough of those things, and we knew the soft body of the hind, and everybody shot at the same time, the chance were good we're going to knock somebody out of the air and save lives. And that's exactly what happened. We had the, 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 the I think it was the Carlos, or, uh, forgot their absolute name, but we had one of the guys in the White House all the time. They were brothers down in Kenner, Louis, oh, Calero, Calero. And we got their agreement to come in. We moved in the HN5A uh, clones of the Red Eye. And we blasted hell out of the Heinz. And then the Soviets complained to our, our, our government that we violated some special rule that we could not shoot them out of the sky. Well, if they're having a, 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 uh, a jungle war, what do you mean we can't shoot them out of the sky? Now there's so, a... Go ahead. So we got in trouble because we we excel, accelerated the uh, the high end helicopter demise. Well, we didn't accelerate anything. We stopped the war. All they had uh, to do was kick was kick them out around a little bit, and the Soviet pilots refused to fly because okay. the little people down below them had had ammo, had had rockets. So they had a special deal. They could they could beat up everybody, kill everybody, but we can't talk about it. What kind of nonsense well, is that? Okay, a lot of people don't understand what really occurred in Iran-Contra, and that was, uh, you know, the supplying the Contras. And then, of course, the Bolin Amendment. <clears throat> that was to keep beachfront property being taken over, basically, by the Soviet Union. And, yeah, but and I testified regarding the Bolin Amendment, and I was in, in all kinds of hearings, and they pounded the hell out of me because I had no right to bring it up. And I'm the chief investigator. Okay. I think you have those files on that thing. We even have case numbers on that stuff. We had customs. Uh, U.S. Treasury Customs was totally working with us because I work with them, too. And you know, we had all these public officials in Washington dirty. And we all got scolded. Got scold, scold. You know, we're all, you don't know what the hell you guys are talking about. You can't go here. This is secret. This is classified. What are you talking about? The ball in the middle is an act of Congress. Now, part of part of uh, uh, Iran Contra, from what I can understand, from what I can see these days, that I never understood myself years ago, is that <clears throat> during the time that the true Iran Contra operation was going on, there was also whether it was known as Eagle, as Al Martin has indicated in his book, The Conspirators. Yeah, they, they called it Operation Eagle, and Daddy Bush under the bull and immediately goes Operation Black Eagle. Well, I'm I'm kind of in the in the in the belief, like Gordon Duff is, that there were actually three Iran Contra operations going on, and that Daddy Bush was running two of them, which was you know the theft through security frauds and and bank loan frauds and all the other frauds that he was doing to rip off the American people and in the name of covert operations of state, why a legitimate operation was going on that you were involved with and others. Would you? Pretty much say that's true. Well, everything we did, we had. I had a mandate from from Reagan himself. Right. And he, a lot of that crap was going on around him, and he wanted us to stop it. And that's why we bought in the uh, the, the 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 red eye clone from China, just to to show our own people that were pulling all this crap over him that he did not approve it, did not just did not justify this at all. And even in Panama, uh, Manny Narega was getting mad at, at Senior because he was making all kinds of deals and threatening Manny Narega, and he was working for the United States. I remember the situation. Yeah, I was locked up, you know, in Springfield with Bob Hunt. He was the lieutenant commander, Office of Naval Intelligence, Naval SEAL, who captured Noriega. And while he's standing there on a the phone, communications with then-President George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, he tells him, you don't bring him alive. He says, no, sir. He says, I have an arrest warrant. He says, that's my job. He says, I'm bringing him alive, and we're going to right. capture him. And, and Bush says, F you, you either do what I tell you to do and kill him, or he says, I'll deal with you when you come back. And he got stuck in Springfield, Missouri, Siberia, USA, for six months in full military uniform without ins insignias, the only guy walking around the prison. <laughs> yeah, but see, the trouble is with that, prior to the attack in... In 
for, against Norega, we had an operation that was approved. We were giving them Browning 9 Mike Mike uh, weapons, and they were all had little diodes in there, so everybody, the, uh, so, the Southern Military Command, we were going to photograph and fingerprint them, have their, their addresses, their girlfriend's names, their everything, and that was we ordered from... from uh, what was that? that, that uh, the Browning, the Browning Nine Mike Mikes. I purchased all of those suckers under the authority of President Reagan, and we were going to deliver deliver for them through the Southern Military Command, where we could photograph and fingerprint his private army, his militia. So therefore, we gave him a nine millimeter Browning, which was the plan, with a very be- beautiful cleaning kit, you know, nice wooden thing, you know, and f- and in order to forget that, everybody had to be signed in, photographed, fingerprinted. And then George Shultz, the Secretary of State, went public and said that I was selling arms to Panama. And that was a sting operation to get everybody, uh, Brownie Nine my mic, they only had one round, and we had dials at every one, so we knew exactly where everyone was. We knew where everyone was living. And George Shultz cuts the deal with uh, some other guy in Panama, and he accuses me of selling arms to Panama, which was a sting that he was not part of. He was protecting the bad guys and overruling what Reagan wanted to get the uh, the identity of all of Reagan's militia. And, and it was all in all the newspapers that I was selling arms and Secretary of State Schultz committed treason against the White House. And I accused him of that. He even screwed us up on the stingers that we picked up from... Uh, from uh, or a boy in Pakistan oh, during the Reagan during the Reagan presidency, basically what you had was a, a coup d'état, should we say, behind the scenes. We had a rogue. Bush. We had a rogue side operation against President Reagan, and that was basically run by Daddy Bush and the, against Herbert the Bolin minute. We had these guys dirty. We were correcting. That's why Bill Casey wanted ISA to pick up the very pick of the litter of the CIA and get rid of the CIA. Because it was a rogue operation. Uh, Ambassador Wanda, real quick, this is Will Wilson. Um, sure. uh, what is the extent of the amount of trillions, uh, just real quick? And if you can, I mean, the public is not real aware of all the things that are involved. I mean, it's very complex, and I know it's very hard to just get one hour to tell them about it. And some of us who are investigative journalists who have been following this for quite a few years and have the greatest respect for you. Uh, in the same perspective, it, what is the time perspective from where this type of insane amount of money, obviously it came out of thin air because it's obviously something, but it is legal, I but guess. Thin air. It was used, first of all, we de- I had $150 billion okay. as my, uh, my uh, nest egg to take down the USSR on the rubles. Okay. They sent me to Vienna. I established New Republic USA Financial Group, LTD Gesellschaft in Austria, in Vienna. I'm still a resident of Vienna. I, I moved into Vienna in June 1988, so I'm not a resident of the United States nor the state of Wisconsin. From there, since Vienna is a spy capital of the world and it's a free zone for spies, I started to use all of our banking resources to take that 150 billion U.S. dollars in a number of banks, and I mean a large number of banks, to start to trade our dollars for their rubles. They were selling rubles at a benchmark of a dollar twenty per ruble. They set the benchmark at the central bank of Moscow, Russia. Okay, so we were gathering up all of the rubles everywhere and and collecting them, and we gave them to Brinks in Holland to wrap and seal them. It's all in the books and all the, the books that just came out: Amazon Kindle, Wanta, Explanation Point, Black Swan, Comma, White Hat. It's all in there, and everything's in there. And we were purchasing all of the rubles that we, and we, we sucked all of them. They wrote articles about me. And they wrote another book, Thieves World, about us, that we took down all the rubles from the street. They wrote a big article in the French newspaper and in Moscow that I was an SOB because they had no 50s and 100 rubles anywhere in Moscow and the satellites and the territories because I had them all. So I left them the ones, fives, and tens, you know. But it's easier at Brinks to count them in the 50s and 100s. We took in the 25s and 20s and all that stuff. But 
the the value was a dollar twenty set by the central bank of Soviet Union. So we forced them to honor that, but then they dragged me over to Singapore with my Chinese partner, because he was the son of a warlord from China, and Shashenko, Viktor Shashenko was the secretary of the Soviet embassy and Babushka from, from the central bank, and they're screaming at me that they would not. They go, Niet, 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 we pay you no dollar 20, no dollar 20. You don't get dollar 20, you take a dollar eight per ruble. And I go, what? I can't go back. I got billions of rubles. They yelp at me in, in, in Russian language that I could only get a dollar eight through the Bank of China and Singapore and other related German banks and Deutsche Bank and everything else and Commerce Bank and, and Volksbank and all the banks that I had under contract. And I had everybody, England, everybody. And my Chinese partner is telling me, we accept. You can't accept. I can't accept the dollar eight. I will be bankrupt. I will be shot. I will be. I can't do this. I can't do this. So we're doing a deal. Karen Carnegie's get back and forth. He's pushing me. I'm pushing him. I'm not taking a dollar eight. And he says to me, "I'm the chairman of a nickel credit. You're the managing director." I said, "I don't care." And we fought. And he pushed me out the door. And they signed the agreements at dollar eight. Now keep in mind, I'm paying hard currency for every ruble I got. I was paying an average of 18 to 22, 28 cents a ruble. So I was getting like five times value. I was really being, being a Polak, Irish in the region. I am really getting ripped off here. I give you a quarter, brother. I give you a quarter and you want to give me a dollar? What kind of lottery is this? So we get out in the car, he's got all the agreements signed and we really did a really good push on these guys because they set the, da- the value at dollar 20 and I'm paying everybody in German marks, uh, Austrian shillings, British pound sterling, Swiss francs, and now the people of the of the Russia. That's why they, they were destabilized. <coughs> now they have real cash, hard currency, other than the ruble to buy uh, food, milk, vodka, flour, bread, beer, meat, anything they wanted. Because we shaped the country economy, and now they're doing that to us in reverse. Now they're tearing us apart. To use our plan, our program, to destabilize the Soviet Union. That's why they didn't have any jet fuel for to fly Aeroflot. I had all, I bought a whole bunch of uh, tank cars, repaint paint to them, had the KGB guard them because they didn't have any idea because I'm from Austria, right? My office is in Vienna. So we had all the tank cars filled in Budapest with jet fuel, JP-1A or 2A, whatever that goofy thing was, and they had no jet fuel. They were absolutely... No place to go. They couldn't fire their missiles at us because they didn't have any batteries to start the power to ignite. And if they did ignite the missiles in the silos, they'd probably blow up. Ambassador Wanda, real quick, uh, yeah. we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back. So hang in there. We're going to start keep that thought. Everybody else, keep that listening. We'll be right back. I'm thinking of that Thank silo. They, they couldn't even fire. We'll be right back. Thank okay. you. Okay. One second. I'll count to then all of a sudden I look down, and here's another one going off, and it looked like the San Francisco area. Then down about Los Angeles, just about to Los Angeles, and then San Diego. I saw those five nuclear-looking explosions, and I tell you, they literally devastated everything. Whatever was in their path, it went into the heavens. In the Russian invasion vision, I saw that massive military. I saw them hitting in on the nation and hitting our coasts and pounding them. Hi, this is Aldi Live. I'm back again real quick. I hope you guys have kept that thought because we're going to get right back to Ambassador Juana and Stu Webb. And uh, I'm right now, I didn't mean to have us have this break. We have to do that. And that's just one of those things that goes along with media. And uh, Ambassador Juana, go ahead. Continue what you were mentioning. That was very okay, interesting. So here, President Reagan's got his own task force, which I was the taskmaster. 
I had full authority. I had $150 billion. I converted that to billions and billions of dollars from the foreign exchange of rubles around the world. They, they ran out of hard currency at the central bank, so then they had to sell 2,000 tons of assorted gold bullion. And I said, okay, 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 I'll buy it. I'll buy it. It's in Fees World, the, the purchase order. So I bought 2,000 tons of mix from like uh, small pieces of gold nuggets to 75 kilo, kilos bars. But at the same time now, under Nash, international law, they have to be resmelted into 12 and a half kilo bars. No big deal. So I get, I just did the best I could by pay wood rubles. And I pay them a dollar eight per ruble. I was doing very well. So I had the air bridge, Brinks air bridged all that to Singapore, and Johnson Massey resmelted all of the, well over 2,000 tons, because the, the, the selenium and other exotic metals, the Johnson Massey told us in Singapore, we didn't have a license for it, they couldn't give it to us, and I said, I don't care, you can keep it. We can keep it? I don't care. They did not know what the value was at 28, 18, 28 cents versus a dollar eight, dollar twenty. You know what I mean? So they had no idea that I had a hell of a slush fund. I, I don't want to get involved with exotic metals. Just give me 12 and a half kilo, kilo, kilo bars, and we had an air bridge back to Cloton. So in reality, and I ran it through my Appleton, Wisconsin address just so it would be notified in Cloton that it was a product of a United States private citizen that owned New Republic USA Financial Group in Vienna and Austria. And it's still there. And then Jim Baker got mad at me uh, a couple of months later. He said that we forgot some of the gold in Liechtenstein and other these other places, these other satellites, um, those three or four satellites that were part of the Soviet, the, Soviet, the Soviet Union. How can I go get something I don't know about? Oh, one was LAT, L-A-T-V-I-A, there was four countries, and that's when they moved some of that gold out of there, and that ferry boat sunk out there in the water. Remember, remember that, Stu? They left the port, and it rolled over. I, I am a little aware of that. I well, anyhow, that's exactly. where they were moving the gold out, and the other one was Estonia, Estonia, and Baker's mad at me because I didn't purchase that. Well, how can I purchase something they don't, they don't offer? They offered me 2000 and I argued about it, and I fought about it, and I said, okay, 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 get it together, and I'll have Brinks have it, have it resmelted. And I gave them rubles. Now, they got tons and tons of rubles, and now they got more rubles, but they don't have any hard currency. Oh, my God. I paid back the $150 billion to U.S. Tre Treasury within six months because I didn't want any debts to anybody. So with all the financial instruments, prime bank guarantees, foreign exchange and Japanese yen, uh, British pound sterling, uh, Italian lira, I was getting like 12, 18% discount on that. On Spanish but sales, I got 28%. Bill Casey would call me up to pay some bills. He says, what are we longing? I said, what do you like? He said, no, what are we longing? Just a minute. We're longing lira, we're longing pesetas and kronas and something else for other previous foreign exchange. And he would call me back a couple hours. I want you to pay this bill in potatoes. Go down to the embassy and take care of it. And we were saving like 18% on the dollar. That's not too shabby. So we saved our government. Paid a lot of bills that way. And German marks was only like, uh, well, German marks was about 6 to 10%, but uh, Swiss francs was like 3, 3.5%. And, and the yen, we're getting yen 10, 14, 15% at a discount. We're the ones that, with that, that, that moved all the yen around. I had a contract with the with the Japan Ministry of Finance. I moved billions and billions and billions. A lot of that through Hong Kong. In fact, uh, the big shot at Citibank was a senior VP. And when all these bailouts, he went to New York for a dollar a year or some goofy thing. You know, I, what a crook deal that sounds like. Because he was trying to stay in the action. Who works for uh, Citibank at a dollar a year? Because he was executive VP. And we were working through uh, North, North, rather South Korea, and everything. We were, we were really doing good work because we didn't report to anybody. The guys reported to me that has a taskmaster, and I reported to Reagan. And he told me, and I had letters. I was in China in 1985 for the entire year. In the Philippines, I was there in '86 for an entire year. We were going to make that a territory of the United States. We had everything all worked out. 
And uh, we were going to really make, make it like a junior Hawaii. And then they could vote on it like Puerto Rico if they wanted to be a state of the union. And that's why we had Marcos. Because Marcos, you have to understand it, and everybody really screwed him up. Being the president of the Philippines, and I have to admit, the approximate value that his take of the Philippine cash flow was one-sixth. So they throw him out to the, 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 it was like a coup. There was five or six groups, uh, the, third, the Thursday night club and all this other. I was sitting in those things until they realized I was not their friend, I was Reagan's friend. And they were really doing a coup. So they had this good go, go government take over the Philippines. Now the people used to get five-sixths of the treasury, they got nothing. These other five groups absorbed, and what uh, Marcos in Hawaii, God only knows where the other, where his money went. And that was, was sad, because that was not Reagan's plan. Reagan's plan was to rebuild the Philippines as, as, a, as a Hawaii, if that's what they wanted. Medicine, new roads, and everything else, just like we're doing in Somalia. Because when you think about Benghazi, it irritates me to this moment. Because if we would have had what we had set up, because I was made the ambassador to Somalia, to Switzerland and to Canada, we would have had Mogadishu Airport, our U.S. Air, air Base, and we would have had a naval supply depot in Mogadishu. So if Benghazi would have had any problems, because we were there for uh, keeping the Cubans out of Somalia and also to protect the Middle East from any kind of rebel bullshit. And we would have been in Benghazi. We probably had destroyers or cruisers out there just for practice, and we would have had our Air Force in Mogadishu, and it's about 19 minutes away. We would have been in, in Benghazi in, in no time. But I don't think they would have attacked Benghazi because we would have had our air, our air station and our naval supply depot right across the pond. You know what I mean? Why would they do such a thing? So I think if we would have had our flag out there, Benghazi and other Libya and all that stuff would not have existed. Uh, to go back, just touch on one thing real quick. Uh, are you aware of where the Marcos gold went out there on the reef? Well, a lot of the Marcos gold was converted to uh, Buddhas, and a lot of those Buddhas were in, in, cigar, in cigar boats, and a lot of those were picked up by agents of many colors. Okay, well, I, I'm also aware of one of my shadow friends. I'm aware of uh, a guy from Modesto, California. I don't want to mention the name on yeah, here. Right. I see that recently he died, but real bad character. And uh, uh, he was one of the ones that made it look like they were putting a lot of that Marcos gold on a ship. And actually, they were loading it, and it looked like they were loading on the ship. But on the other side, it was getting loaded onto a uh, boat, and that boat took it out and dumped it on a reef outside of the Gulf there. And, I have uh, not heard that, but I do know yeah. they... They re-smelt a lot of that gold into Buddhas, and we captured a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> I think the Glomar Explorer could probably pick up that gold one day out of that reef, and uh, <clears throat> that would be the way that Daddy would get his uh, it, get to stolen. Uh, yeah, but it should be hard to find it if it's on a reef. We have enough technology to find each and every Buddha or, or whatever. And I don't, I'm confident it's not all... Uh, I don't think it's the 12 and a half kilos, because that was before 12 and a half kilos was the uh, the standard, you know? Right. Like, was, uh, uh, like, like the I USSR, it could they be were, anything. Mm -hmm. But they restelled a lot of that they were, raw stuff to, to Buddhas. I understand they did it in rails, anything they could <coughs> put it in to, to, uh, to, to dump the gold in. So yeah. it was, uh, you know, big bars and oh, yeah. different things. It wasn't in kilos, but anyway, we'll talk about that off the air. But uh, go ahead with what you were speaking about. So yeah. Pre President Reagan did take down the Soviet Union. He made the orders, told us to do A, B, and C. Didn't care how we did it, just get it done. He saved a lot of lives. He saved our our world economy. The Soviets backed off, and, Yel and Yel Yeltsin took charge. And Yegor Gadar, he became the vice, where he became the just like me, co-chairman of Rush R U S S. I'm the vice chairman of Rush. And that means that we own a hell of a lot of territory and companies in the former Soviet Union. And that's, and I don't know whatever happened. I own a lot of oil and vodka and buildings and stuff like that. 
but by them taking me all away from the scene, and even though New Republic, and you have the contracts, I believe, on the on the rubles, we had the only contract to rebuild the Russian Federation. I think you have that from Phil from Filchin, Gennady Filchin. You have that. What's well, in the book? So 50% of Rush belongs to the, the Russian Federation. Yegor Gadar was the prime minister. And the other 50% belongs to the director general of New Republic in Austria, which is me. So I, I own billions and billions of dollars of property and national resources in the former Soviet Union. But the family feels that I was employed by Uncle Sam, so therefore they own everything. Now, who are they? Because if anybody that owns it, it would be 35% taxes and would go to the American people, not to the politicians. I don't report to a politician. Reagan no. was not a politician. He was the president of the United States and that's an institution. Uh, you answer directly the president. And yep. here you got... No one else. No one else. And here you got a treasonous, I call him the treasonous punk Daddy Bush. On He's the just other side. one of many. They one got... Many. They got they got an angle to take care of everything, which is probably the original plan from the beginning. Because remember, a lot of people are elected so they can be controlled. President right. Reagan wasn't going to be controlled. That's why he brought us in through uh, Senator Wiley and everybody. And we started from nothing. And that's what Reagan wanted. He wanted us to go out and find the truth and correct it. He knew, had rumors at JFK the problems with the mob and everything and the military industrial complex and the corporations and the mob and everybody else and he didn't want to get killed so he wanted to know who what he had to do to protect the american people he was a true american he used to talk to us all the time my fellow americans need this they need that they need this he was not a bad guy he was just trying to do his job his job was protect and serve the american people not not a political party. He didn't care about a political party. He was on both parties. He was a Republican and a Democrat. Whatever he wanted to be, he was still in America. That was he soulless, even in arguments with other people. What was good for the United States of America, the American people, not the Republicans or the Democrats or the Socialists or the Communists. He cared less about that. He wanted him to represent all the people. He doesn't represent... Like, you know, we got Obama, we represent the Democratic Party. He was never that way. He was for all the people. He didn't care if we were black, blue, purple, ink. You know, he was truly a true American. Ambassador Water, real yeah. quick. Uh, we've got about 12, 14 more minutes left. I just wanted to ask real quick. quick. I've followed yeah. you quite extensively, read everything I could on this. Is there any circumstance coming up? that uh, this amount of money is ever going to actually effectively be put, brought back into the system to do anything? Otherwise, are we going to see a financial collapse and all that will be sitting off well, somewhere? Yeah, the financial collapse already because they want all the money and you and I don't count, nor the Stewart and his family and everybody else. But keep in mind, in May 2006, the Bank of China sent $4.5 trillion to me, the beneficiary, the sole beneficiary, not an employee, me to the Bank of America in Richmond. In fact, Judge Lee ruled that I should pay 35% instead of 38%, 38.6% because I repaid, created that money, that I had a court order from the Chief Judge, Daryl Bruce Lee, in Richmond, Virginia, calling the money uh, lick, to, lick, to liquidate all the corporations that I own under Executive Order 12333 and Presidential Directive number 166, which was Sodom's, well, which was the, the problems that, they're, they're all in the book. So I moved $4.5 trillion into the Bank of Richmond, Bank of America in Richmond, Virginia. And when we had the chief counsel of the Federal Reserve Bank in front of Judge Ellis, he said that everything that I said was true, the money came in, but the money was now under the control, the custodial control, safekeeping, of Henry Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury. I'm not married to him. I'm not dating him. I don't expect to date him. I don't expect to be his son-in-law or anything like that. He had no authority to take that money from the Bank of America in Richmond and divide it to wherever he wanted, the Goldman Sachs and all these other. And we had proof. And the chief counsel told the Judge Ellis 
a chief judge of, a, of another federal court in Virginia that everything I said was true. The money came in May 2006, and they're not responsible because the Treasury of the United States took that $4.5 trillion from my sole beneficiary. It's all in the book. All the receipts, everything. The tear sheets, everything. Now, you and I do. was happy that the judge said pay 35% tax on that money, which is $1.575 trillion to the American people. And I know it was in 19 to 24 months, if I would have been left alone in May 2006, we would have had our national debt paid off between 18 months and 24 months, irregardless of the banks, because I didn't have to, I never worked with the banks. I worked with other banks. I'm not a politician, nor am I a bankster. Yeah. Now, your website is uh, wanterevelations.com plus, and that's where everybody can get their free book. Uh, you can get it book. free. There's 16 chapters in there under Wanta Explanation Point, Black Swan, comma, White Hat. Or they can go to Amazon Kindle and buy it there for nine ninety nine and have the whole book at even more than the website because they got all the, uh, the audios and stuff, you know, and all the proceeds from this is going to charity. Uh, it's going to me. I don't want any money. I got money. Yeah. I just got to get it. Ambassador Warner, real quick. Don't this laugh too hard. I had, a US, I had a senator call me the other day about eight, nine, ten days ago. Hey, congratulations, Warner. You got paid. I said, Senator, I got paid. And I'm so happy I got paid. But you know, I got paid so much, I have to give a refund now. And he goes, what? And then he hung up. I haven't been paid. They say I've been paid, and that's why I told the senator, I've been paid so many times, now I have to give a refund. I have never seen a dime, not even a half penny from Singapore. Ambassador it's Warner? In the, it's all in the community of the banks. Uh, I was going to ask you. away to foreign c c countries. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. I wanted to ask you really quick, um, in the circumstances that we're looking at on a worldwide basis, uh, so this money will never effectively be brought back into the system, will it? I didn't say that. I'm fighting every day of the week. Okay, because now all the bailout money can be clawed back. That's all credits. The seventeen trillion dollar debt could be wiped out in a matter of uh, two or three banking days because you send an invoice to all the banks and the bailout money and the TARP money and give them an invoice because that money was not legally released from the Treasury. And the Federal Reserve released the money. They didn't have any money. They charge us interest on money they don't have. And it's a paper value of absolutely BS. So none of that money exists, and we're paying interest on non-existent fiat currency? Talk about treason and stupidity. We have no national debt, certainly not $17 trillion. I'll pay it myself. Uh, it doesn't bother me when I order. I'm, I'm 73. So how could, we, how could we actually have a debt in the circumstance that we're looking at a uh, president that nobody even knows who he is? Um, and they get in from, through vast vote fraud that's unbelievable. Um, so we got these, this government that's not really even our government. It's their appointees to do something else. But in the meantime, uh, how could we have a debt ourselves of $17 trillion if We they, don't have a debt. It's a moral that's, debt. It that's, what I said. that's what I figured. They have, they have quadrillion in derivatives, which has no legal recourse for a collection. So we got all this safekeeping receipts for derivatives that has no cash value, write it off. It's bullshit. It was corrupt to begin with. It's insane. They have no legal collection, no legal recovery, and it has no cash value. So just why are we pretending we owe bills that don't exist? There's yeah, it's no amazing. Foundation. The United yeah. States Congress cannot create a law to break a law. And the, and the Fed Reserve does not exist. You keep the Fed Reserve clearing house for doing the checks, and you put it under the Treasury and abolish it and nationalize all the big banks that stole money from our American taxpayers. Can they get a hold of you through? Can they get a hold of you through your website, uh, WanderRevelations.com? I've got the. I so. I've got your information up front here, WanderRevelations.com. Um, now, what it is is we're under a kind of a a financial dictatorship that's telling us what we're supposed to go along with or or die. It's corruption. Yeah. Insane. There's nobody in charge. Interesting. Yeah. This is a simple thing to take care of. Oh, the banks are going to be upset. Well, they've been living high on borrowed money that doesn't exist. Let's tell the truth here. Interesting. The Federal Reserve Bank gave all this money not only to our U.S. banks. Oh, by the way, the Federal Reserve system is owned by the banks. 
and also the London, the Bank of England, and all these guys, and watch Charles and all these guys. So it's just a big mirage of nothing. It's yep. like me winning the lottery for five million bucks, and when I go to cash, and the guy tells me, "Oh, it's a fraudulent uh, coupon, and you don't get paid." But I, I got it from the teller. Oh no, teller made a mistake. So they keep the five million, and you, figure, oh my God, I got ripped off again, because they declared it's not a real a real ticket on the lottery, even though you bought it at the grocery store or something. You know what I mean? Isn't that amazing? They can do that because they're in charge. Just ask them; they'll tell you. Or as Stu knows, they'll wipe you out. It's kind of the Wizard of Oz, isn't it? Uh, some guy, some character. It's worse than that. The Wizard, Wizard of Oz, you can really see it on the stage. Yeah. But in this case, it's a movable object of collusion, corruption, conspiracy to to defraud. And I'll give you some of the of, of the statutes because Stu knows I wrote this up already. Under the, uh, the statutes that they can get nailed for immediately is uh, Title 18, Section 2. Uh, 35, 241, 242. We can put a block into their nonsense pronto. They have no place to go. Because those are criminal and criminal procedures are on the books and porting and conveying false information, which is Section 35 in Congress, Section 371, conspiracy to commit offense or defraud the United States, Section 372, conspiracy to impede or injure an officer. They tried to kill me so many times. I've been raped and plundered. They thought I would die, but since I'm a Catholic, I haven't given up that right to die yet. <laughs> I, I, I respect that. Um, in the circumstance, we've got about... They grandson, didn't they, Leo? Yes, they did. He's 11 years old. He's a twin. They operated him for brain tumors, and he didn't have a single brain tumor. You're kidding. Like about... Ugh, when did this happen? Years old. An innocent child. And he died? He's dead. Oh, he died. They I'm, so, I'm sorry to hear that. To get to Leo. Well, well, he died. Some, oh. Well, they, they warned me, and I guess I didn't warn him. I didn't take him serious. Jeez. He's 11, 11 years old. They said he had brain tumors. They operated. They cored seven holes or eight holes in his head. And the, the autopsy yeah. showed he had a, an abscess, a tooth abscess. Where the tumors oh. came in and the x-rays is beyond me. They don't exist. They never existed. When At this funeral, when they took off his little baseball hat, everybody went, wow. They were shocked. They had all these cord holes in his skull. That was scary. Jeez. It's just like crazy. somebody dropped the biggest bomb in that church. Everybody was shocked when he t closed the coffin. He had to take off his little base, 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 his baseball hat. And all those big cord holes were just visible as hell. Um, we've got about three and a half minutes left. Real quick, uh, one last statement. Well, I appreciate this. Can we do more programs with you? I'm available if I, if I can get through. A lot of times my phones are turned off or, you know, they come and they go. My computers are hacked and sh erased. I'm on about 12 computers already. I'm down to none again. Well, I appreciate that. I think there's information that we're just getting to, but we don't have time. We've, we're only an hour program during the week. This is All Day Live. I'm Wilpie Wilson, and we're listening to Ambassador Leo Wana, former uh, Somalia ambassador under Reagan, right? Not uh, under Reagan. They not, gave me that job oh. because they wanted, we wanted to put Mogadishu as an air base and a naval supply. Reagan, that was something that came through our Pentagon and oh. O&I and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Uh, any books you like? Operations to protect our, uh, our world, our Mother Earth. Yeah. Nobody cares about it except a handful of people. Uh, who, you're, who you're dealing with here, uh, uh, Will, is... a. Uh, uh, a super spook, super spy, yeah. uh, one that gets things done. Uh, <laughs> Ambassador Leo Wanted, one of the best there ever was. Real quick, we've I'm got about two, two minutes left. What books do you recommend, uh, books you've written, Ambassador Wanted? Well, the book that just came out now okay. is called Wanta Ex Explanation Mark uh, Black Swan, comma, White Hat. That's on, <laughs> excuse me, on Amazon, Kindle. Okay. Nine dollars ninety nine cents. There's can they other books out there about me? And Thieves World is one by Simon and Schuster and Schuster and Schuster. There's other. There's about eight or nine books wrote about me. But the latest one it took us five years to do because of all the political threats and and nonsense which we just ignored is at at, at Amazon Ken, Ken Kindle just came out about three weeks weeks ago. You can Everything also find you need to know about corruption is there. Uh, you can also find uh, Leo stories uh, on my website on stewweb.com in the right column. You see Leo Wanta, uh, and click on that. Um, it uh, takes you directly to Veterans Today, 
uh, or you can go to veteranstoday.com forward slash author forward slash wanta, W-A-N-T-A forward slash, and there's his uh, stories, several of them up there, if you want to take a look that way. We're really greatly honored. Actually, could we uh, plan for a program next week as well? I think we're just getting into this project, and I think it's important because when we're looking at a global economic collapse of some form, I think that we're going to find remedy. Am I wrong? Well, it's all, it's, all, it's all there. Okay. Everything we can do within days to reverse it, because it's all it's all BS out there what they're doing to us. Yeah. They are totally destroying our country for obvious reasons, and the people haven't seen it yet, but when they see it, they're going to have to feel it, and that's going to be a lot of problems for American people and the rest of the world. Look what happened in Cyprus. Look what happened in Greece. The banks and the military-industrial complex, the politicians, everybody's got a price tag. I don't say everybody, but the majority, because this can never have happened unless there was a uniform body and plan to take down everybody. The New World Order sucks. Um, and, Will, and Will, how about we uh, just start reschedule for next week and we go for yeah. next Thursday? You're going to have to go do that. Let's Every do that. I'm going to wake up. I'm we happy wake up. We'll do that. I'm a target. You know, I, can, I, I couldn't even guarantee a, a dental appointment. appointment. Appreciate it very it, much. Every day is planned. Yeah. They don't work. They don't work. People come. People go. People help me. People give me this. Give me a file. I give them 10 files for one file. And uh, we're not afraid of them because, you know, I'm 73. I'm an American. I'm going to die an American. Well, we're greatly honored. Let's uh, let's uh, converge back to television media again next week. Let's get to more of this. I think we're going to work towards finding remedy. I think more people need to know about this. At least it could be a remedy. Everybody in Congress knows about this. Everybody. Everybody's been served. All 450 or 475. There's nobody in the administration, previous administrations, or acting senators and congressmen, House of Representatives, and their advisors and their helpers. Everybody knows, including China, Russia, England, every country in the world. We go to everybody. Every day we're coming out with blurbs, as Stu said. There isn't anybody, unless they're part of the system or they're afraid of the system. And I don't blame them for being afraid because this is a big deal. It is a big deal. No idea what a big deal it is. And he knows. Biden and Obama know exactly. Everybody in Treasury knows. Everybody in the Senate. There is nobody that's an elected official could not have been informed one way or the other. Because I know our situation is in their face. And that's why the senator called me the other day. He said, ah, congratulations, you got paid. I said, Senator, I got paid so many times, I got to give him a refund. And he goes, what? And I think somebody slammed the phone down on his finger. Well, we're greatly honored. We're at the end of the program, and thank you very much. Uh, and we should convene you. back on this. I appreciate everybody watching. Send your information uh, questions to StuWeb at StuWeb.com.